Uh, hello, everyone. So um, I think it's just time that we start our next talk. So before I allow the speaker to talk, so bear with me a few minutes so that I can introduce the speaker. So welcome, everyone, to today's talk about active compounds in crops. It is the 15th talk of a series targeting to promote agrobiotechnology and enhance understanding of the potential applications of agricultural products. We hope the series will inspire international scholars, researchers, farmers, and business in the agricultural field, as well as the interested public. First, let me introduce our speakers today. Dr. Jack Wong, Wong Wing Duck. He is an assistant professor, um, actually, um, well, he was, this is the assistant professor now in the School of Life Sciences of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. After, after the undergraduate studies, he decided to pursue a career in biomedical research and subsequently earned his PhD in physiology from the Chinese University of Hong Kong in 2009. Dr. Wong has been awarded a postdoctoral fellowship from American Heart Association to gain postdoctoral training at Stanford University. Before becoming an assistant professor of Houston Methodist Research Institute and Mayo Cornell Medicine of Cornell University in 2013. So Jack has been an assistant professor in the United States before returning to Hong Kong. He has published over 100 research papers and review articles in the area of vascular medicine and biology in high impact journals, including circulation, circulation research, cell metabolism, hypertension, diabetes, antioxidants, and red dog signaling, etc. Okay, so many different kinds of uh, biomedical journals. Dr. Wong is currently an academic editor for clinical and experiment, experimental pharmacology and physiology, and also an editorial board member of food and nutritional sciences. Data set papers in medicine, vascular medicine, and World Journal of Pharmacology. He has also served as a peer review committee member of the AHA study sessions and has an external has been an external review for University of Macau and for the National Natural Science Foundation of China. So we are very happy that uh, with all this background, uh, Dr. Wang decided to join our efforts in agriculture. In the following presentation, he is going to introduce the bioactive compounds in crops and their roles in health promotion and prevention of disease and share his works to demonstrate the novel cardiovascular benefit of active compounds from food sources. So let's please welcome Dr. Wong to the floor. So Dr. Wong, Jack, please. Thank you, Professor Lam, for your nice introduction. Let me first um, share my slide. Okay. Can you see my slide now? Yes. Okay, thank you. So good evening, uh, everyone, and maybe good afternoon for guests in uh, Africa. Um, my name is Jack Wong, and first of all, um, definitely thank uh, Professor Lam for the very nice introduction. And thank you, uh, Professor Lam, for his kind in invitation to join this talk series, Echo Biotechnology Talk Series. My name is Jack Wong. As mentioned, I am an assistant professor at the School of Life Sciences. Today, my talk is on the bioactive compounds in crops. Okay, so here is my talk online. Okay, so here is my talk online. So I will talk about what are bioactive compounds in crops classification of bioactive compounds. I will discuss a little bit on the role of some typical compounds in uh, uh, typical bioactive compounds and its role in health promotion 
and prevention of diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases. And we also share with you our, some of our published work and the present research data on the bioactive compounds in crops, including the isoflavones and the aspergillosite. So let's get started. Where are the bioactive compounds in crops? So bioactive compounds are the components of food that have an impact on the physiological or cellular activities in humans or animals that consume food. So in general, the plant metabolites can be classified into two major groups, including the primary metabolites and the secondary metabolite. For the primary, primary metabolite, they're basically used for the overall growth and the development of the products, which include protein, lipids, and carbohydrates, for example. Most of the plant bioactive compounds are indeed so-called secondary metabolites, which give plants their color, the flavor, and the smell, the aroma. And they also play an important role in the competition, defense, attraction, and the signaling of the plant. And in this case, they, the, for, the, for these bioactive compounds, they include amines, alkanoids, glucosinoids, cyanogenic glycosides, polycaptides, phenolics, and the terpenoids, for example, as shown in this diagram. So there are many of them. So in general, the, for the bioactive compounds, they can be classified into three major classes of the bioactive compounds. Include, they include the phenolic compounds, about 8,000 types of the different phenolic compounds can be found, and the alkanoids, about 12,000 types, and the terpenes and the terpenoids, about 25,000 different types of these terpenes and terpenoids can be found. So in this table, you can see a general classification and some, some example for these bioactive compounds. So we can see that with some, some compounds that carries a nitrogen, these include, for example, the alkanoid, that for example, the major example is the caffeine, and some of these long, pro, long, amino, long protein amino acid amines. So different types of the compounds are with the nitrogen that's shown in this table. And some of these bioactive compounds that, did not, that are not carrying the nitrogen. Examples include the terpenes, the terpenoids, uh, and, and, and as shown here. So the, uh, the phenols or this compound, okay? So let's actually first talk about uh, some of these examples or the, of these bioactive compounds. So first of all, it's the phenols. So for the phenols, in Chinese is the, the word phenols indeed is come from the Latin word phrases, meaning yellow, their color in nature. So chemically, flavonoids have the general structure, general basic structure of a 15 carbon skeleton. Okay, so which consists of two phenyl, two phenyl group, phenyl rings A and B, and a heterocyclic ring, the C ring. The C ring containing the embedded oxygen here. And their basic uh, carbon structure is C6, C3, and C6 in the core. Okay, so for the diet and, and the dietary sources of the flavonoids include the parsley, black tea, some wine, cocoa, and the berries, cauliflower, cauliflower, and the cucumber. So that are mostly actually found in our food. Over 5,000 naturally occurring flavonoids have been characterized from various plants. They have been classified according to their chemical structure and are usually subdivided 
into these subgroups. For example, the phenol that contains this example is the catechins that are found in uh, tea, and the isoflavone uh, that including the phytoestrogen from the soybean that include the genistein and the daisin. And the uh, anthocyanidine that includes the anthocyanin derivatives, okay? And also the phenol that includes the crocetin or the crocetin. And also other types of the um, flavonoids include the flavonones, the charcones, and the flavon. These are the examples of the flavonoids. So flavonoids itself are important source of antioxidants. So they carry and they possess some free radical scavenging activity, and they also can inhibit enzyme, the reactive oxygen species producing enzyme, including the xanthin oxidase, and they can be applied in, main, in treating some diseases, mainly in the cardiovascular disease and also in cancer because they possess some anti-inflammatory effect. And they can also have been shown to have the protective effect against the liver degenerative diseases. Okay, so in this graph, you can see that there are many different functions of these flavonoids, including the mainly actually they are inhibiting the reactive oxygen species production and inhibiting the pro-inflammatory signaling pathway. So one of the examples for the flavonoids is the anthocyanin. So for anthocyanins, these belong to the class of the flavonoids and they have water soluble vacuolar pigments and that may appear purple, red, or blue colors, depending on the pH. They are found the, for the anthocyanin, they are found in all plant tissues, including the fruit, the stems, leaves, flowers, and, and roots. Okay. And mainly they possess as the, as the colored pigment, they mainly possess the antioxidant property because the, for the anthocyanin, they can donate electron to, a, to hydrogen to a highly uh, reactive radicals and first cheating, being, cheating, being cheated as an antioxidant, they, have, they can actually serve many purposes and can be used to treat many different diseases. For example, they have, for the anthocyanins, it has been uh, demonstrated to have the anti-diabetic, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, and the antioxidant effects. And for the uh, anthocyanin, so this compound can either be metabolized by the gut microbiota or be modulated by the gut microbiota, and they possess some of the cardiovascular benefits that I'm going to show you in this in the following slide. So for example, so in, for the anthocyanins, so this compound can be metabolized or modulated in the gut by the gut microbiota. For example, in the gut, we, uh, there are some, there may be the beta glucosidase, okay? That can convert the anthocyanin into, by some of these, either the beneficial bacteria or the harmful bacteria into the colonic metabolite that include all different types of these uh, different anthocyanin metabolite, okay? And then in this case, actually these uh, different types of either the anthocyanin or the anthocyanin derived metabolites, they may have, they, they have some antioxidant properties that bring on the protective beneficial effect of the, of the anthocyanin in, in different biological function, okay? And for the cardiovascular benefits of the anthocyanins, studies have demonstrated that the consumption, consumption of the berries is associated with lower myocardial infarction, the MI risk in the young women as shown in this graph here, with three portions of the blueberries, of the berries, including the blueberries or the strawberries, it can significantly reduce the myocardial infarction rate risk. 
And also, on another study, it has been demonstrated that for the blueberry consumption, the intake of the blueberry can improve the endothelial function in the randomized clinical trials. Okay, as shown in this study, so with uh, one cup or the half cup of the blueberries uh, consumption, it can significantly improve the endothelial function as measured by the percentage of the forearm dilatation, vascular dilatation, and also increasing the cyclic GMP production as the cyclic GMP is a metabolite. It's a metabolite of the lactic oxide because the lactic oxide is, is released from the endothelial cells that act on the vascular smooth muscle cells to synthesize the cyclic GMP. So by measuring the cyclic GMP, it is a indirect, it is a indicative indicator for the increase in the lactic oxide production in the endothelial cell, reflecting that the endocytin can improve the endothelial function by promoting the production outside in the endothelial cells. So apart from the flavonoid, so terpenes and the terpenoids also contribute, uh, comprise for the most, uh, in, in, it's a major uh, components in the bioactive compounds in crops or in plants. It is the largest group of plant secondary metabolites containing more than 50,000 hydrocarbons. So for the terpenes, there is a linkage of the isoprene, the C5H8 unit, and for the terpenoid. So it contains, apart from the terpene, it, it has an oxygen containing functional group. So mainly they are found in water cow oil. Examples are the menthol, the uh, ketesol, Artemisinin, uh, ginsenosides, and the tensional uh, 2A. These are mainly found in, for example, in the Chinese medicine, richly found in some traditional Chinese medicine. And they possess some pharmacological effects, including the anti cancer effect, anti inflammatory effect, and the antimicrobial effect. So, for the terpenes, so one example for the terpenes is the lycopene. So lycopene is responsible for the red color in vegetables and fruits, including the tomatoes, watermelons, and the red grapes. So they they have uh, they can initiate some the direct uh, cancer fighting properties and prevent the oxidation of the low density lipoprotein, the LDL cholesterol. They have also, it has also been shown that the, for the lycopene, it can reduce the risk of developing arteriosclerosis, the blood vessel, some, some form of the, uh, blood vessel disease and the coronary heart diseases. So mainly for the lycopene as shown here, it possess some anti-inflammatory effect and can be used as in this graph, you can see that they have it boost up the immune system as well as preventing cancer. <clears throat> so for, how about the terpenoids? So terpenoids is the uh, compound with terpene and the oxygen containing functional group. So example for the terpenoids is the carotenoids. So carotenoids, itself is a yellow, orange, and red organic pigments that are produced by plants. Carotenoids give the characteristic color to the pumpkins, carrot, corn, tomatoes, and the sweet potato, potatoes, etc. And there are four primary sources of the carotenoids in human diet. They include the lycopene, the beta cryptosamphine, beta carotene, and the lutein. So for the beta carotene, it is also known as the pro-vitamin A. It can be converted by our body into vitamin A or the retinol that are important for our, the development process. So apart from the flavonoids and uh, uh, terpenes and the terpenoids, plant steroids also is one of these bioactive compounds in crops. For the plant steroids, they are a group of substances made in plants, which include the phytosterols, the phytosterols, and 
their fatty acid esters. So plant sterols are found in highest amounts in foods like the vegetable oils, nuts, and seeds. And the plant uh, sterols can also be used as a medicine because so plant sterols, they are mostly uh, commonly used for lowering the cholesterol, plasma cholesterol levels. The cholesterol-like property of the plant sterol can affect the cholesterol absorption of the plant sterols over the low density lipoprotein cholesterol, so-called bad cholesterol, which can naturally, naturally reduce the level of the bad low density lipoprotein cholesterol in plasma in our blood. So when consumed in recommended amount, around 1.5 to 3 grams per day, plant sterols can reduce the level of the LDL cholesterol in plants by 7.5 to 12%. Glucosinol, glucosinolate, um, is this uh, bioactive compound contain sulfur and nitrogen and are derived from glucose and an amino acid. So every of these glucosinates contains a central uh, carbon atom, uh, contains, a set, contains a central carbon atom, which is bound via the uh, sulfur atom to the file glucose group and via the nitrogen atom here to a sulfate group. Different glucosinates have different side chains or side groups. And this is, it is varied in the side group that is responsible for the, vari for the variation in the biological activities of these plant compounds. Glucosinolates are lateral compounds of many pungent plants, such as the cruciferous vegetables, such as the wasabi, broccoli, cabbage, kale, watercress, and the garden cress. So the pungency of these plants is due to the mustard oil produced from the glucosinolate when the plant material is chewed, cut, or damaged. These lateral compounds or chemicals most likely contribute to the plant defense against pests and diseases. And it impart a characteristic bitter flavor property of the cruciferous vegetables. Several glucosinolates and their biologically active metabolites, particularly the isothiocyanates, have protect even have the protective effect against cancer and dementia. And it has been shown that these compounds can lower the risk of dementia and slow down the rate of cognitive decline in the elderly. Tannins, so another bioactive compounds are tannins, tannin. So they are complex mixture of polyphenols with garlic acid as the base unit. The color of tannins ranges from colorless to yellow or brown, and they are mainly the key sources of tannins are the teas, coffee, pomegranates, uh, and most berries and the spices. So it has been shown in animal study that the tannins can be used, can, uh, can reduce, can decrease the food intake. And it can also be shown to decrease the effectiveness in converting the absorbed nutrients to, uh, to our body. And other functions of the tannins include the acceleration of the blood clotting, reduction in the blood pressure, as well as reducing the serum lipid levels and modulate or improve our body immune responses. So finally, for the, for, uh, for the bioactive uh, compounds that I want to share briefly today here, it's called the betalins. So betalins can be divided into two subclasses, including the beta cyanins that carries the red or violet color and the beta xanthins that are yellow to orange in color. So betalins itself have a wide range of biological activities with potential health benefits. For example, they can reduce the inflammation, protect the, li uh, the liver and have anti-cancer and antioxidant activity. 
So uh, apart from these beneficial effects, betanin, so because of its color, uh, it, it, can, it has the red, red or violet com, uh, color, it is commonly used as in the red food colorant. And due to their no toxicological, uh, low toxicity and their safety, these uh, compounds can overcome current concerns over the health risk of the artificial colors. Okay, so previously I we briefly go I briefly went uh, talk about the uh, bioactive compounds in crops that can prevent or control some diseases. In this part, in the second part of the talk, I will talk about the effects of the bioactive compounds on some major chronic diseases. First of all, this is the cancer. So uh, as an introduction, cancer is a disease in which um, our body cells grow abnormally. So cancer is affecting many people in, in, our, in, in the world. It's one of the most important and major causes of death worldwide and cause a global cancer burden. So one in five men and one in six women worldwide develop cancer during their lifetime. That indeed many people die from this disease. And in order to prevent and control uh, the risk of the cancer, so it is believed that uh, the easiest way to do this is by consuming enough fruit, enough fruit and the vegetables that can indeed decrease the risk of cancer, particularly the lung cancer, the prostate cancer, the breast cancer, and the head and neck cancer. So for the lung cancer, so lung cancer is actually one of the uh, leading cause of cancer death, uh, apart from other uh, cancer, including the um, colorectal cancer, stomach cancer, and the liver cancer. So uh, the most common cause of the lung cancer is tobacco use, as you may already know. And tobacco that is found in the cigarette and the pipes and the cigars. And most of these lung cancer are caused by smoking. So it has been shown that for the beta carotene, these bioactive compounds that, have, that is found in the carotenoids. So some carrot, for example, they, it has been shown that it can reduce the uh, morbidity of the lung cancer due to the increase in the beta carotene supplementation. Okay, so in this case, some of these bioactive compounds can be used to, at least to reduce the occurrence of the lung cancer according to some epidemiological studies. <clears throat> so, um, and, and another type of the cancer is the prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is most common in men over the age of 65. And similar to the uh, lung cancer, carotenes uh, that are found in the dark leafy greens, greens uh, vegetables, sweet potatoes, carrots, can also help to reduce the risk of prostate cancer. In this regard, some tomato uh, products and because the lycopene is one of the major bioactive compounds found in the tomato. They have been suggested to be used to treat or to prevent the prostate cancer. Um, apart from these different types of, and, and indeed, so there are other uh, evidence and studies demonstrating the use of the bioactive compounds in preventing or treating the head and neck cancer, the breast cancer, the esophageal uh, cancer, colon cancer, and the gut cancer. And it has been known or suggested there is an inverse relationship between the uh, serum concentration of carotene and the cancer risk. So suge suggesting that the consumption of these bioactive compounds, including the carotene, may somehow reduce the risk of the different types of the cancer. So apart from cancer, um, Janice, uh, the effect of these some bioactive compounds, for example, the Janice team has been proposed to reduce the risk or to treat the uh, diabetic mellitus. In the world, we know that 
uh, there are many people suffering from the diabetics uh, mellitus. And sometimes we'll just call it diabetics. Diabetics is a condition in which the body, our body is not able to, to uh, use glucose properly. And uh, there are different types of the uh, uh, diabetics, the type one diabetics and the type two diabetics. And usually for the top uh, one diabetics, our beta cells cannot produce, uh, there's the this damage of the beta cells that in this case, our body cannot synthesize uh, insulin. Okay, and if without the insulin, the glucose cannot be utilized and to be used by our body cells. And in this regard, so studies have demonstrated that, okay, so uh, genistein may be one of the, this is one of the isoflavone, uh, can, be can be used to um, somehow improve the conditions of the diabetics mellitus. So gen genistein is found in, soybeans and the soybean products and also in the fava beans. And the genistein treatment has been shown to increase the beta cell proliferation in cell culture models, as well as the pancreas of the genistein treated mice. And it has been shown in a human study that conduct uh, in the postmenopausal women that genistein given at a dose of 54 milligrams per day could help to reduce the fasting glucose and increase the glucose tolerance and the insulin sensitivity. Um, so some of these biotic compounds have also, have also been shown to have some beneficial effect in treating cardiovascular diseases of which one of the cardiovascular diseases is the so-called atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis is the dominant cause of the cardiovascular diseases. And it can lead to myocardial infarction, MI, heart failure, or stroke. So the plaque buildup in our cardiovascular system itself, this is called atherosclerosis. So when, the, they, when sometimes when the plaque is ruptured, it can even cause more problem because the plaque can flow around our bloodstream and then they may block the uh, some major blood vessels, including in the coronary arteries that will lead to the myocardial infarction, or if, if, if this plug go and then block the cerebral, the brain artery, it can cause the ischemic stroke. In this case, so uh, some studies have also demonstrated that uh, berries itself are good sources that have a good sources of the polyphenols. So these can are uh, associated with improved health of the cardiovascular system. So mechanistically, the berries uh, consumption can significantly reduce the low density lipoprotein cholesterol oxidation, prevent the lipid peroxidation, increase the total plasma antioxidant capacity, and uh, uh, reduce the dyslipidemia and improve the glucose tolerance. And in some other, in some studies further, it has also been shown that these polyphenols can upregulate the endothelial nitric oxide synthase, the ELOX. In this case, it can be also help increase the nitric oxide, may improve the endothelial function or the muscular function. It can also uh, reduce the oxidative stress and inhibit the pro-inflammatory gene expression in uh, in some immune cells, for example, in the macrophages, and that actually reduces the foam cell uh, formation. And foam cell actually they are they are macrophage that engulf that have pick up a lot of the low density lipoprotein, okay, the fat, and then eventually these foam cells may form the plaque, okay, and in this case, the consumption of the polyphenols or the berries may help to prevent the cardiovascular diseases. So now we finish, uh, I talked about some of these um, bioactive compounds and their role in cheating diseases. And now let's move on to some of our um, studies, okay? So it has been known that uh, one of the risk factor 
of the cardiovascular diseases is the menopause as shown in this slide. So endothelial function as shown here is impaired across the stages of the menopause transition in healthy women. And uh, I did not to say that uh, when there is, uh, when women actually becomes, for example, 50 to 60 years old, the uh, ovaries is dysfunctional and they, can they cannot produce the estrogen. And this leads to the so-called postmenopausal uh, syndrome. And that actually affects the uh, women cardiovascular health. In this regard, our previous, our previous work have demonstrated that for the chronic uh, cranberry juice consumption, it can restore the cholesterol profiles and improve the endothelial function in the, in the overactomized rat. So this is the animal model of the postmenopausal women. So in this case, we treated the uh, cranberry juice to the overactomized uh, female rat. And we, have, we can demonstrate and show that the cranberry juice consumption, it can reduce the circulating levels of the total cholesterol, triglycerols, and increase the high density lipoprotein cholesterol, and reduce the uh, protein cholesterol level. And more significantly, as we can see in this uh, result, the cranberry juice consumption can improve the, the endothelial function in the aorta of these overactomized rat, as shown in this uh, figure. So you can see that for the overactomized rat, the acetylcholine induced endothelium dependent relaxation is significantly impaired. And with the consumption of the cranberry juice extract, so this endothelial function of the overactomized rat is reversed. So suggesting that the cranberry juice can somehow improve the endothelium dependent relaxation in the postmenopause in the in the in an animal model of the postmenopausal women. And not only about the post uh, the cranberry juice, we have also demonstrated that for the uh, black tea. So black tea, we know we know that the black tea is the fermented tea. So this is totally fermented. And the, for the black tea extract, that mainly contains the, the field favorites, so one of the bioactive compounds in the black tea. It, when there is a consumption of this black tea, what happened? So in the previous study, we showed that this cranberry juice can improve the uh, endothelium dependent relaxation in the, in the big artery, in the aorta. In this study, we further actually demonstrated that not the, for the black tea, it can also improve the endothelial function in the overreactomized rat. And apart from, so we have them, we have do this in the big artery and not only in the big artery, but even in the small artery, in the mesenteric resistance artery, that, uh, that, that, that in this case, the resistance artery itself, actually they contribute mainly to the regulation of our blood pressure. So in this case, we can, we can see that for the, flow mediated uh, vasodilatation. So in the overactomized rat here, in the mesenteric arteries of these, uh, of these, uh, of these rat. So this flow mediated vasodilatation is indeed actually significantly reduced. And upon the chronic treatment of the black tea to this rat, we can see that the flow mediated vasodilatation Okay, you can see in this graph, they improve significantly. And, to, and actually quite similar to an effect, actually similar to the positive control of this rat when we give the estrogen, estradiol to this rat. So the effect of the black tea is similar to the estradiol. So suggesting that for the chronic black tea treatment, they can also use to be used to improve the vascular function in the maybe in the overactomized uh, rat. So suggesting it may also be useful to improve the vascular function in the postmenopausal women. <laughs> so not only in the, um, and, and we actually go further to study the effect of the black tea and then we find the mechanism of how the black tea can protect the endothelial function or the vascular function in the 
uh, in red. So in this study, we not only not only in the uh, overactomized fat or the insulin deficient uh, rat, but we actually create a model. We um, in, we introduce and a hypertensive model by uh, injecting or by implanting a osmotic pump uh, carrying angiotensin two. So angiotensin two is a peptide that can increase the blood pressure of the of the animals. In this case, we inject we, we infuse the angiotensin two to uh, mice. Okay, to the to the to the to the uh, to the mice to the rat. Okay, and then we treat as well to, to use the black tea extract to treat the angiotensin two infused uh, uh, male stroke dolly rat as well. And we can also see that the black tea extract can improve the endothelium dependent relaxation caused by the axial coding. So in this case, uh, this again suggests that uh, further confirm the protective effect of black tea in preserving the vascular function. And uh, in this case, we further go ahead to understand the potential mechanism. And one of the uh, key markers that, up, that is upregulated during the angiotensin II infusion is the increase in the so-called the ER stress, the endoplasmic reticulum stress. And our study confirmed that the black tea treatment can protect the endothelial function through reducing the endoplasmic reticulum stress. As shown in this figure, you can see that for angiotensin II infusion, it increased the ER stress marker, including the PEIF2 alpha, the ATF3, and the ATF6. And the and importantly, the black tea treatment can somehow reduce the upregulated levels of this ER stress marker in the aorta. And, and this actually provides some evidence of how the black tea improves the vascular function in hypertension. So lastly, uh, some of our research in, in, in our research group uh, now here is a, a doctor uh, she, so she led a project to investigate the effect of the isophate foams that, uh, that is derived from the soybean, soybean isophate foam. And she used, by using an animal model of the um, overactomized mouse model. So she demonstrated that the, for the treatment of, the, of these isophate foam to the mice, they can improve the, again, the acetylcholine induced uh, endothelial, the impaired uh, endothelial function in the overactomized mice. So you can see that in here, the black square here is the uh, acetylcholine mediated endothelium dependent relaxation in the uh, overactomized mouse aorta. So with the treatment of the isophate foams, you can see that the, uh, inverted triangle here, though they can significantly improve the vascular function in the uh, overactomized uh, mouse aorta. And uh, you actually further demonstrated that for the isofree foam treatment, so they can reduce the reactive oxygen species production as shown in this graph here. You can see that this is a cross section of the blood vessels. So the, for the DHE dihydrogephidium uh, dye here, DHE dye here is used to stain for the reactive oxygen species, the uh, free radicals. Okay, so this in this case you can see that for the overactomized uh, mouse aorta, it shows a higher DHT signal, suggesting that there is an increase in the reactive oxygen species in the vascular wall. So interestingly. For the isofavon treatment, so you can see from this graph, so both the isofavon treatment and the estrogen, they both reduce the reactive oxygen species. So some of, the, uh, I haven't shown the slide data here, but what year Dr. Shi has shown is that the isofavon can somehow reduce the, one of the 
uh, so-called FKBB5, the uh, FK506 binding protein 5, uh, which, which is a gene by encoding for the FKBB51 protein in the, uh, in the mouse, okay, in the, in the animal, that actually contribute to, and by inhibiting the FKBB5, it contribute to the improvement in the, in the vascular function, as well as the glucose tolerance. So finally, uh, what I want to share further uh, with this limited time here is uh, one of my PhD student work. Uh, in this study, she has been, uh, she has used the uh, aspergillosite. So aspergillosite is a bioactive compound in a plant called uh, Dujong. So, so it's, it's, it can be derived. So in, in, as shown here is the Dujong. Oh, this, is, this is, for the Dujong, this is one of the uh, Chinese medicine. And, uh, uh, and what this study actually did done is uh, Maple proposed to isolate the aspergillosite from, the, from this plant, from the leaf of this plant. And aspergillosite as one of the terpenoids, it is a monoterpenoid. So this has been uh, indicated in some previous study. It, can, it has the anti-obesity effect effect for the aspergillosa is effect on the cardiovascular function is not fully understood. So what um, Mipo has shown in this study is that this aspergillosa and, and a bioactive compound from the, from the Dujong, from this plant. So this possess a protective effect against the cardiovascular dysfunction. It can protect against the obesity induced. So but what happened is she Maple treated these rat, these mice with a high fat diet, 45% of the fat and cholesterol. And it shows that with the increase in the high fat diet, with the, with the, with the feeding of the high fat diet, this HFD significantly impaired the endothelial function of these mice. And what she did is she treated the ASP, the aspergillosite, to these mice, to these high fat diet cheat, uh, fat mice. And she showed that uh, this compound can improve the acetylcholine induced endothelium dependent relaxation in these mouse aorta, in the hyper diet induced uh, HFD fat uh, mouse aorta. And, and then she further go, went on to study the mechanism in, and, 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 and she maybe show that the asparagine can somehow activate or increase the uh, an antioxidant uh, mechanism through the NLF2 uh, hemoxygenase 1 pathway. So as you can see here, so this aspergillosite treatment can significantly reduce the reactive oxygen species production. And her study indicated that this may be due to its effect on upregulating the NLF2 and uh, HO1, which are the antioxidants to reduce the oxidative stress in the vascular wall. So finally, uh, the take home message for my talk today is that first, uh, various bioactive compounds, such as the, we have that shown the fav some flavonoids, some phenolic compounds, anthocyanins, carotenoids, the pansterols, the glucosinolase, and the tannins, betalins, genistein. They have been described and evaluated for their protective effects in human health. Indeed, they have possessed, they have some unique antioxidant, anti inflammatory, and anti carcinogenic properties. Which can be used uh, to uh, have to to which have been shown to have protective effect against some chronic diseases and metabolic disorders such as diabetics, cardiovascular diseases, and cancer. And obviously, further research is needed to understand the exact mechanisms of their biological actions of the active compounds in the crops. And um, and it is. Uh, definitely no doubt that we should eat more of the fruit and the vegetables from the crops so that we can get these bioactive compounds and we can obtain the benef benef beneficial effect 
from that from these uh, positive uh, health uh, effect. So finally, uh, finally, I would like to uh, take this chance to thank um, Professor Lam again for the kind invitation uh, to share uh, this work. Uh, some of these are uh, some basic background on the bioactive compounds in the crops and and I'm very glad to uh, have the chance to also share some of uh, our previous work as well as some of the latest work from my group uh, investigating the effect of some uh, bioactive compounds in treating or preventing cardiovascular diseases. And most of this work is uh, done by uh, Dr. Christina Leung and um, Dr. Yue Shi and Ms. Maple. Uh, my PhD student. And I'm also thankful for uh, the, again, thank, thank you very much for the chance of uh, sharing this work uh, to you, to all of you. And thank you all for your listening. And fi finally, I'm also very thankful for the financial support from the state key laboratory of the Ego Biotechnology, the SKL in the CUHK, and also for the research grants council to uh, support our work. And uh, with that, I, I would love to end here and um, any questions are welcome. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you, Jack. So I guess, I guess maybe you can stop the sharing first yes. so that we can see each other. So um, before we have the discussion, so as usual, I would invite everybody to uh, oh, turn on the camera so that we can take the pictures together. <laughs> so for for record, so please um turn on the, the camera. And Joanna, when you're ready, let's slow so that you can take picture for us. Yeah, I see a lot of um, familiar faces. So very happy to see everybody's here. So Joanna, when you're ready, let's slow. Okay, so everyone, please look at the camera. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, one more. One, two, three, smile. Okay, one more. One, two, three, smile. Okay, done. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I'm happy to see um, <laughs> Jack joining our team because Use, we used it to grow plants for our leaves, but now we can move into the functional food to improve our health. So the value of the agricultural product will be increased very much. So, but anyway, um, let's start our discussion. Maybe I help Dico to raise his question. I, he had posted in the chat box. So I think it's a scientific question. While we can use the anthocyanins to reduce the RS, but it's apparently RS is also an important signal in our body. So how to strike a balance between the white right level of RS, RS required in our body? So this is a question from our South African friend, Diko. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ludidi, for your last question. Thank you, and hello. Good afternoon in, in Africa. It's very nice to meet all of you. And I'm good afternoon. Good afternoon, Jack. Really grateful for this chance to meet friends from Africa. It's really amazing. So, yes. for your this question, actually, this is a, a great question, but uh, definitely, um, as as we all know, so reactive oxygen species as one of as this carrying the uh, oxygen molecule. Um, this can also be served as one of some of the signaling molecules in the cellular signaling pathway. And it is required for, for these uh, reactive oxygen species in part of the signaling molecules, for, in, particularly in some immune cells, for example, uh, for the macrophages. So our body immune system require these reactive oxygen species to kill the pathogens, including the bacteria or the virus that get into our body. But what actually is dangerous or is not 
is harmful. Uh, the other side of the reactive oxygen species is the overproduction of the reactive oxygen species of these oxidative stress, so-called oxidative stress. That is due to the imbalance between the reactive oxygen species that are generated from the oxidases in our body, as well as the reduction in the antioxidant that is used to counteract with the reactive oxygen species. So what the dilemma here is, so, okay, on one side, we lead, definitely lead these reactive oxygen species, a basal level of these, as you have mentioned, basal level of these reactive oxygen species to maintain or to at least actually keep the our cellular signaling pathway to work. And also in our body, we lead these reactive oxygen species to protect against, to act as a host defense, to protect us, to protect us against the pathogens. But what in usually happen in the so-called metabolic syndrome, obesity, and the obesity induced or the, some metabolic syndrome or it, including that affect our cardiovascular function is that the overproduction of the, oxid, of the reactive oxygen species that lead to the oxidative stress. They actually lead to some detrimental, to some damaging effect on our cardiovascular system. That actually leads to many of these diseases, including the hypertension, the stroke, myocardial infarction, et cetera, et cetera. That affect our blood vessel. So what happened here is that, for example, in your question, um, the level of the anthocyanin that is, that is required. And this actually is a very important um, question. So I, I, think, I don't think at present it is known how, what is the optimal amount of, the, of this biomet bioactive uh, compounds to, reduce, to uh, have a beneficial effect. But from the studies, from previous studies and also from our studies, we have actually kind of suggest that the consumption or the use of this anthocyanin can somehow protect the cellular function by reducing the reactive, by reducing the oxidative stress. Okay, so, and again, from your for your question, I, I again I actually um, uh, totally agree with you that also uh, not only the anthocyanin but also some other natural compounds, and that's why I do believe that from the last line of my talk, I do believe that so in order to prevent diseases, okay, apart from these bioactive so by consuming more vegetables and fruit from our diet, it can actually increase our consumption or the intake of these bioactive compounds, including the anthocyanin, the flavonoids, the beta or all, all these different types of the good bioactive compounds that may actually help to improve our health. Particularly in our study, we have mentioned about the cardiovascular diseases to improve the vascular function as well as Okay, to be to reduce or to prevent to reduce the incidence of or to be to, to reduce the risk of getting cancer, and then with that, I think, uh, thank you again for your question. I so, hope I yeah, yeah. So I I think uh, back, uh um, Matthew, uh, you have a question, right? I saw I saw you type it in. Maybe you can just talk. Right? Ah, yeah. Hello, Han Ming. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Jack, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting and clear presentation. Indeed, I, I put a question in the chat box. I was yeah. wondering uh, if you can say something about what is known about the genetic basis of the bioactive compound levels in plants. Uh, is there anything known about the heritabilities and can they be increased by, uh, by breeding efforts? And perhaps are such breeding efforts ongoing for certain types of bio compounds? Yes, uh, so a lot of questions, I realize. <laughs> Thank you. I have read your questions. This is a very interesting question. So as I mentioned, so for these bioactive compounds in the plant, they are usually so-called the secondary metabolite. So for these secondary metabolites, they are usually used mainly for the host defense, for the plant to defense against the adverse environment, right? So, so I believe that from if you if your question is on the heritability, so I believe that there must be a lot under after many decades or years of evolution. For some reason, the plant may acquire these genetic traits that actually they increase the, there are some, maybe some insertion of the gene that we don't know from which source that I don't know. I don't think people know about this, but it will be interesting to know about the, the, ba the basis of these genetic changes that actually give 
the plant, the genes, okay, the DNA to encode for these secondary metabolites to fight against the adverse environment, including the, the water drop, the, the lack of water, the 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 the, the, the extreme uh, temperature, either the too high temperature or the too low temperature, or uh, the pH or the salt set or the salinity. So, but from my understanding, I think I do think that this would be a very interesting question to look into, look into the, the, the genetic trait of the plant. From when, starting on from when, these plants actually produce, can pro start to have the genes that encode for these secondary metabolites. I'm sorry, I cannot, I, I do not know the cat. Uh, I don't know the answers for this question, but this definitely, this is a very interesting question. I don't know whether Professor Lam would have some comments and what is the, <laughs> uh, what is the basis of- Okay, so, so let, me, let me share, right? So there's two <laughs> factors affecting the accumulation of secondary compounds. As the Jack said, when you stress, either it's biotic or abiotic. One example is anthocyanin. So if you stress the plant, immediately you get a higher level of anthocyanin. So changing the environmental factors, some fruit may, may change color, then you accumulate more, more color, okay? So that is one way. So for the genetic part, so I, I just want to share one research that we are doing. So we are comparing the wild soybean to the cultivated soybean in terms of the flavonoid compounds. And in the wild, uh, the, the wild soybean require the flavonoid compounds to protect them. So they produce in a higher level. But during domestication, the secondary compounds usually do not give a good taste. <laughs> so we see that against it and reducing the amount. But at the same time, human protects the crops. So during domestication, some of these um, secondary compounds may have reduced level. That's based on we have study in comparing wild and cultivated soybean. So I, I think both environmental factors and genetic factors are important to, in order to increase the functional part of the secondary compound. There's just this a little supplementation from my side. Okay, so hopefully I can <laughs> possibly answer McHugh's question. Thank you, Professor Lam. I think this is uh, exactly, I think it's very important research from Professor Lam. Yeah, yeah Matthew is, is from Thank Poland, you. so you get a European audience today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, other questions, please, from the audience? Feel free. Joanna, can you just, just unmute yourself and talk, Dr. Chen? Uh, hi, Dr. Wong. Thank okay. you for the very informative and clear presentation. Uh, my question is about what is your view about this, uh, all these supplements? that are selling in the market now. There are so many of them and they're selling so expensively. And um, what is their function versus taking the natural fruits and vegetables? Thank you, Doana. Nice to meet you again. Um, I agree. So there are actually nowadays many different types and varieties of the supplement that are on the, in the market. Personally, I'm not against uh, the use of the supplement because especially in the modern society, uh, people actually don't have the time to enjoy food, to eat, the, to, to have some proper meals. So the use of this supplement may somehow, if they cannot eat properly, this supplement may somehow uh, supplement what they lack of. And for this, top, for this question, I think we can understand this in two ways. So first is whether this supplement have the biological function, have the, have the function, so-called these uh, so-called the functional food, whether these are really beneficial to our health. Are we actually in, the, in lack of these uh, functional food or the food supplement that we need to take more? Another issue and concerns is about the safety of using these supplement or food supp or, or supplement in, to, to supplement our diet. So in this case, it requires the safety use or safety dosage and the uh, chemical or the Mean, uh, or the heavy metal, and this should be all produced in, uh, in a good manner in the GMP facility that, uh, that actually produce a good quality of this food supplement. So again, back to my last slide, and I do think that uh, if we can, if we can actually obtain food, if we can obtain these um, bioactive compounds 
from our lateral foot. And the best way to do this is again, we actually obtain these bioactive compounds from mainly from the fruits and from the vegetables. And, and, and that said, I'm not against of the use of these uh, supplements because indeed we, we all understand that nowadays people actually don't have, maybe actually they're too busy and then they may skip a lunch, they may skip a dinner, they may skip some lunch, they may actually do not eat some types of the food. Okay, they may actually focus on their meals on some fast food. And in this case, there may be a lack of these, for example, the dietary fibers, they may lack of these main uh, vitamins or for example, some of these antioxidants. In this case, as long as, I mean, the, for the food supplement, if they are safe and in both the quality and the dosage, I believe that uh, this should be all right. Okay, and I, and I think this is really, this is also a trend that um, people started to use a lot of these, uh, at least the supplement, especially for the old age, because one of the key questions, one of the key part is for the age, for the age, for the old age people, for the old oldies, uh, their appetite actually reduce. They cannot actually eat too much. So in this case, some nutrient supplement. So in my opinion, maybe actually. Uh, good for their health. So some evidence actually, people actually has used this uh, glucosamine, for example, to treat, to actually to use to prevent the deterioration of the joint, okay, of the cartilage of the joint. So this actually has been used quite widely and has been shown have some good effect, although some more evidence need to be um, uh, uh, provided. But again, in my own personal opinion, uh, I do think that um, again, this is a huge market, and, and but obviously, the first priority definitely is from our natural natural food. So if we can obtain these uh, ingredients or these bioactive compounds from the natural food, then we can we should go for it first. And if we cannot actually obtain this from our natural food, my personal opinion is it is there is no harm as long as the dosage and the safety of this supplement is carefully monitored. I, I would like to give you a number. Mm -hmm. So in, in US, US 2020, so the world's markets for dietary supplements is 400 billion US dollar. It's a huge number. So, but the, the, this discrepancy is like this. So the pharma produce the raw materials, which is very cheap. Then when you have a way that to invest a production plant to convert some of those into dietary supplements, you can make a big profit. Unfortunately, those profits go to those people with money to invest <laughs> so that they can buy very cheap uh, raw materials and convert into something very expensive, put them under the name of dietary supplements and, and sell to the rich market. So I, I, I hope that um, if this kind of power can transfer to farmers, making them, enabling them to produce some of these uh, su supplements in addition to the raw materials, then it will significantly help the income of those farmers. But it, it requires some initial investments, but the, but the market value is high. So imagine, right? 400 billion US dollar for one year. So that number just strike me a lot. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Dr. Chen's question. So is there any other questions from the audience? You can unmute yourself or if your microphone is not working, you can type in in the chat box. Well, I, then maybe I, I just re rephrase uh, Dico's previous question. Uh so about the uh, Canberra, <laughs> so so Dico oh, make a comment on the Canberra. So Dico, can you can you yes. uh, talk about this question? Yes. So um, oh, I'm trying to. So what what I was saying maybe it, it points to this aspect about this um, repackage um, uh, nutritional supplements because um, if 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 you look at the experiment. Um, Jack's experiment did not use uh, isolated compounds 
they were using, you know, wholesome, uh, uh, um, wholesome juice uh, from the cranberry. Uh, and certainly there are bioactive compounds in the cranberry juice, but they actually did the job without having to isolate individual compounds and putting together a concoction of different compounds. And I think that's very encouraging in the sense that it shows that we don't actually need to have pills that have been concentrated in some uh, factory to uh, to make to have an effect because I mean just the juice had this very very significant um, effect. So uh, it it was really to um, to comment on the fact that um, I I, th I think that just by uh, eating healthy foods like the the fruits that we know have these beneficial effects um, is enough uh, in my opinion. And I think um, that evidence of that is, um, you know, in ancient um, well, people who were actually relying on wild fruits that have these beneficial, beneficial effects, they had less ailments and so on. Uh, so that was just to comment the work to say that, uh, you know, sometimes we don't necessarily need to focus on artificialization of the natural products, but rather get them as they are. Thank you for your remark, Dr. Rudidi. Definitely agree with you. With a balanced diet and a moderate amount of food is all the key for our life. So I do, I do agree with you. I cannot agree more. Okay, so any other questions? Please feel free to, to ask. So apparently we don't receive further questions. Okay. Then maybe Joanna can do a little advertisement for our next talk. So uh, Joanna, please. Thank you, thank you, Wasalem. Thank, thank you, Jack. Uh, so our next talk will be given by Miguel from Panama and he'll be talking about farming and agribusiness. So actually he gave his first talk last August about farming and I, and this will be his second talk. And he'll focus on like how to run a uh, farming business and how to start. So please uh, stay tuned and you may register through this QR code. And we will also send more information to you by email. Yes. Because the last time um, Matthew has prepared a long talk, so I asked him to divide into two parts. When he, last time he talked about his personal experience in a farm and so how to deal with the people working in the farm. And this time it's more on the business aspect. So if you want to start a agribusiness, so what would be the conditions and requirement? And he, he has a big farm in Panama and he has business with different people. And he's willing to share his experience with those uh, who like to uh, initiate a agro business. Um, so I, I hope that if you want to know more about the business side, this is a good chance to discuss with Mikhail from Panama. And he will be zooming from Panama because the, the situation of pandemic is not under control yet. So previously, he would like to join us in Hong Kong to do the, the talk, but now apparently he, he cannot come to Hong Kong and will stay in Panama. Okay. All right, so I guess um, for fans in Hong Kong, good evening, and for fans in other area, maybe good afternoon or good morning. So I, we, we have to conclude here, and we thank the speaker, Professor Jack Wong again, and I'm happy to see everyone's here and hopefully we will see each other again in the next talk. Okay, so bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.